I was telling Luke this past week, I, 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 don't, I don't do PowerPoints well, so we're going to do one slide. So this is your slide for the morning, all right? That's it. Just watch me instead of that, and you'll, we'll do fine. So Romans chapter 8 and verses 12 through 17, that's, where, that's going to be our base of operations this morning. Though we're going to be looking at a lot of other places, learning a lot about about what God has given to us in order for us to be successful in putting to death the deeds of the body. So just as an overview, I want to say up to this point, Paul's been presenting a picture of our fallen state. And in this section of Romans that Luke began a few weeks ago in Romans chapter, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah, 8 verse 1, and moving forward from there, um, the apostle begins to the, the apostle begins to outline the solution to the wretched state that we found ourselves in that the gift of the holy spirit in our lives is critical and key to our success and we're going to learn more about that this morning so as paul as paul will relate the through the power of the holy spirit we can liberate we can be liberated from the law of sin and death we can know that we can have victory even though we still struggle with our propensity to sin. We can gain confidence. We can gain certainty. We can gain comfort in knowing that there is now no condemnation for those of us that are in Christ Jesus. That's the good news. Do you know that, that here in the book of Romans, in the first seven chapters, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit one time. He mentions the law and commandments almost 30 times. But here in chapter 8, he kind of switches gears. And in chapter 8, he mentions the Holy Spirit 19 times. Now, why do you suppose that is? Well, it's because his focus is shifting to the believer's justification through faith in Jesus Christ, to the believer's ability to, to live the Christian life through the empowering, the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. That's where we find strength. That's where we find victory and accomplishment. The Holy Spirit plays the key role in the sanctification of the believer, freeing us from the chains of sin to live lives of honor to God. I don't know about you, but that is really, really good news to me because those chains can be strong at times. And to know, as we're going to learn this morning, and I'll try to outline as much as I can for you today, to know that God has given to us the power and the ability to have victory over those chains that we allow to still have sway in our lives. You see, it's the Spirit that frees us from sin and death. He enables us to fulfill God's law. He, he changes our nature. He gives us uh, stability to overcome the desires of the unregenerate f uh, flesh. He confirms our adoption as God's children. He guarantees our eternal glory. In short, there can be no success in the Christian life apart from an utter dependence on the third person of the, Holy, the, third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. I want to take a moment and kind of step aside and, 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 and kind of give a brief overview of the, 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 Spirit's, uh, the, the, the Spirit's work in our life. A brief overview of the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a divine agent who creates, sustains, and preserves spiritual life in those who place their faith in Christ. He's not merely an influence or an impersonal power emanating from God. He's, he's a person, the third member of the Trinity, equal with the Father and the Son. His actions show his personhood. He functions with mind and emotion and will. This is kind of an overview of what you can see in the scripture about the Holy Spirit. He functions with, with mind and emotion. He, he loves the saints. He communicates with us. He teaches us. He guides us. He comforts us. He chastises us. Does he not? He can be grieved, he can be quenched, he can be lied to and tested, and he can be resisted and blasphemed, the scripture tells us. He's called Lord, he's called God, he's called the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of God, uh, our advocate, our comforter. And since Pentecost, he's indwelt every believer. He illuminates 
When you read this, the, the word of God and you pray that God might open your mind to understand, the spirit of God accomplishes that for you. He illuminates your mind so that you understand the deep things of God. So here in Romans chapter 8, we begin to, we begin to see how God is using and, and desires to use the Spirit of God to give us victory and attain many things. In fact, there are four things that we receive as believers that are listed here in Romans 8. There are many more, but here in Romans 8, there are four things that I want to bring out of, the, bring out of these passages, these, these verses, that help us to see what God is doing on our behalf. And the first one is there in Romans 8 and verse 12. So then, brethren, we're under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you've not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him so that we may be glorified also with him. Four blessings today. Four exciting things that we can see that the Spirit brings to us, gives to us at the moment of our salvation. And one of which we're going to look at this first is something that we need to be tapping into. Notice there in... Verse 12, I can keep the wind from blowing my Bible. So then, brethren, he's building on what he's just said. So then is another way of saying, therefore, because of what I've just said, because there's no condemnation, because God is involved in our sanctification, because of those things, brethren, we are under obligation. Not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Not like the lost are. Those folks that have not placed their faith in Jesus Christ are under obligation. It's their nature. They will continue to live in sin and there are, it's a hopeless state for them to be in. And their only resolve is faith in Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God coming to live in their lives. And we're going to see that as we go further forward. But what this is talking about is we as believers are not obligated to that old flesh any longer. Not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Verse 13, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. We're no longer obligated to that old man. The residual is still here. God has asked us to stay in this world for a little while longer because he's got things for us to accomplish for him. And so we remain in this world with the spirit of God living within us, but we still have these bodies of flesh that we're living in. And we're still struggling. There's still the pressure of the world outside, the, the sin that so easily entangles us, uh, Satan and his cohorts and the pressure that they put us under, the world and the systems that we, we have to work in every day. All of those things come crashing down upon us and pressure us and push us. And there are times that we succumb to that. And it's because of the flesh that we're still living in. And yet, God is giving us, and this verse begins to outline that, the power to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Look with me. If you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We are not obligated to the flesh any longer. However, we are obligated Hey, just as a side note, if I might say, I think there's this tendency in the church today <clears throat> to believe that we're free to do whatever we want. That the freedom that Christ has brought to our lives releases us to be whatever, act however, say whatever, because God has forgiven us. And friend, I want to tell you that, that in my opinion, that is a, a lie from the pit of hell. It is error and it is wrong. We are obligated to one of, in one of two directions. We're obligated to sin in the flesh or we're obligated to God. And if the obligation to God is to put to death the deeds of the body. If by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So... 
The key to our success in gaining victory is the enabling and ever available power of the Holy Spirit. A power that we have to tap into. I remember as a young father, we have three children, they're all grown, they've got many of them, both two of the three have children, and anyway, our oldest son, when he was maybe two, three years old, I had this old pickup truck that I loved, and he would used to get in the front seat, and you know how the kids will do it, and they stand in the seat, and he's got a hold of the steering wheel, and he's doing his thing, because he's watched dad drive the truck a lot of times, and he's, he's in his mind, he's driving. And just enjoying it. He's not going anywhere. I'm standing in the sidewalk watching him. He's just sitting there with, screwing around with the, with the, with the uh, steering wheel, acting like he's driving this car. He's not going anywhere. All of the power of that truck was available to him. He wasn't using any of it. I mean, it's a separate issue as far as maturity and ability and all the rest of that. That's not the point. The point is, is that the power was there. He didn't use it. He was playing games. The same can be true of believers today. You have within you, my Christian friend, the power to put to death the deeds of the, of the flesh. All that you need, it's there. And it's the enabling, indwelling, powerful spirit of God that lives in your life. When did he come? You know, there's, there's some, some basic theology that we need to make certain that we're all understanding. When did the spirit of God come into your life? He came into your life at the instant of your salvation. When you placed your faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of God baptized you into His body. You were brought into the family of God and the Spirit came to live inside of you, resident in you. The third person of the Trinity lives in your life, bringing all of His power, all of His ability, all of everything He possibly can, and it sits there and waits for you to tap into it. If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you live. You see, folks, the Spirit is power. I want to. I want to show you a couple verses, if you'd like to. I said we'd. Romans chapter eight was going to be our place where we kind of hung out, but we're going to jump around a little bit. So look with me, if you would, and, and just a couple quick verses. Acts chapter one, verse eight. You may have committed this one to memory already. It's a special verse. Acts chapter one, verse eight. Jesus says this about the Spirit of God to the disciples. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. The earth. Why? Because the power of the Spirit of God will inhabit you. And you tap into it and you'll be faithful and you'll be successful. Why? Because the Spirit is power. The word there is dunamis. It, it's the same word we, we get dynamite from. The Spirit is explosive. He moves us. He challenges us. He changes us. And He gives us the power to live the Christian life. Keep your finger there in Romans chapter 8. And turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. A verse that I know many of you know. And we're going to start reading in verse 15. And we'll come back to Romans 8 here in just a moment. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? Look at verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, that's excessive, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled. It actually literally says, be ye being filled. It's ongoing, it's constant, it's forever. It happens each and every day, each and every opportunity that you have to, to ask the Spirit to fill you and give you the power that you need to live, ask for it. Because it's an ongoing, perpetual thing that you and I, and we can, we can, we can un unplug that, we can, we can lose that power as we allow the, the sin of the world to sneak into our lives and we confess that and set it aside and we ask to be filled with His Spirit again so that we have the power to put to death the deeds of the body the deeds of the flesh. You shall receive power and be filled with the Spirit. So back in Romans chapter 8, while it's saying that you're putting to death the deeds of the body, it doesn't mean that we do so to earn our standing with God, but rather that through the power of the filling of the Spirit, we're working out. We're, we're growing in what is already there. 
already happening, already assured. In fact, let me read uh, another special verse that I like. And you can keep jumping around with me if you want, or you can just listen. In Philippians chapter 2, listen to what Paul says to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 12 and 13, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It's work. We're focused on it. It's a daily, moment-by-moment -moment decision to walk with Jesus Christ. But listen, he goes on in verse 13, listen. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You may be working it out, but God's working it in through you. It's the Spirit of God that He sent into your life that gives you the power, and then He expects us to tap into that and to live for Him. So then, how do we live in the Spirit? How do we, in the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the body? I like being practical if I possibly can. So I've come up with some steps. No, let me rephrase that. I haven't come up with them. I'm going to share a few steps that I believe are biblically, biblical steps for us that we need to work on to put to death the deeds of the body. Steps that you're aware of. Steps that are basic. Steps that we fail in from time to time. First, We need to recognize sin in the flesh. Do you remember the verses that Luke read this morning in Psalm 139? Search me, O God, and do what? Know my heart. Search me and know my heart. You spend time each day and recognize that there's still sin that you can slip into. There's the pressures of life that come crashing in that are there to cause you to slip. And we simply need to understand that sin is real and uh, it's still alive in the world and it still impacts us from time to time. And we need to stay focused on understanding that sin is still there and can still be in our flesh. And we need to recognize that. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. And lead me in the everlasting way. Convict me. Remind me. Point out those things when I think of them, when I consider doing them, maybe even when I do do them. Remind me that sin is, is, is impactful and it's still there. Second step that we can take to be successful in putting, the de putting the, to death the deeds of the body is, and I remember I told you these are basic, so listen close, spending time with God in prayer. Listen to some words from Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. The end of all things is near. Is that true today? You bet it is. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sober judgment. That's your mind. It means spend time in the Word and understand what the Word says. Be of sober judgment excuse me, sound judgment and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. God says, come to me in prayer. Remembering what my word says, remembering what my promises are, remembering what, my, what the future is going to bring because my word says it. Remembering that you are, are a believer. Remembering that I will be victorious. In those contexts, bring to me those things that I need to, I need to interact with you on. Pray. Pray. I want to tell you guys, what we did this morning, as we came apart, let me say that differently. We didn't come apart, but as we, as we stepped aside, we prayed as the body of Christ. Do you know how much power there was involved in that? All there is. Because, because the power of the Spirit of God was here and amongst us and indwelt those of us that are believers in Jesus Christ. And we prayed before the throne of heaven to the God of creation, to the God that created Kobe. And said, Kobe, and said, Lord, this is our heart's desire. And the word says we have what we asked for when it's according to his will. 
We can believe that today. And we started it some days ago and we're hearing good news and we just are going to continue to believe that. But I want to tell you something. The power of prayer in the life of the individual believer and the life of the church of Jesus Christ is critical to our success. Oh, that we might become a praying church. Luke and I talked about it this, this morning. We've been, we've been talking for months. You know, what is God doing in this time of COVID? <laughs> What's he doing? Why is, why is we going through this? Could it be? Could it be to make us prayers? I think we do pretty good in studying the word, though we can do better. <laughs> I think we do pretty good in some other areas, but maybe we've become a bit reticent in our prayer lives. Not only individually, but maybe collectively as the body of Christ, it's time for us to maybe a little more often and a little more lengthy bring those needs that the body has before the throne of grace together and be a praying people. You want to reach the lost? Pray for them. I had somebody the other day say, well, I'm not sure how to share my faith. What verses should I use? I said, just hit your knees and ask God for the right words. You're not the one doing it anyway. God draws people to his side. And you can say the wrong thing at the wrong time and they'll say, how do I get saved? I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I'm sharing my faith with a friend of mine on the beach in Wildwood, New Jersey, which by the way is where Denise and I met. And we were sharing our faith on the beach and he was just butchering the gospel. And then, to top it off, and hopefully this is not inappropriate, a seagull right on his shoulder while he's talking. And I'm thinking, this is over. This guy's, this guy's laughing. He's... What happened five minutes later is that man prayed to receive Christ. Why? Because the Spirit of God drew him, and we were faithful to go. It wasn't our words. It was being faithful to share the good news. Let God do his job. You be faithful to go. But it starts with prayer. Spend time in prayer. Recognize sin in the flesh. Spend time in prayer. Second, uh, thirdly is, is how do we, and again what we're talking about is how, how do we tap into this ability, this, this spirit of God to give us victory over sin. Recognize sin. Spend time in prayer. Thirdly, meditate and study God's word. Time is moving along, so I'm just going to read a couple of these verses and you can, you can uh, follow along. But I, I, I was looking at several different people in the scripture about what their attitude was toward the word. And the psalmist in Psalm 119, which by the way, you ought to read. I think every verse in there except three, is it three? Every verse except two, three, talks about the importance of God's word in your life. And there are some wonderful passages. In Psalm 119, if I might read you a couple. Psalm 119, verse... Let's see. Verse 11. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I might not sin against you. Treasuring God's word in our, in his, in our hearts. And, and, and uh, you might later on, uh, I will not take time to read it now, but verses 97 through 100 talk about the importance of hiding his word in our heart and the impact that's going to have in our lives. Solomon in Proverbs chapter 2 talked about the importance of the word of God in his life. But if I were to point you to one, area, one section of, of, of scripture that talks about the importance of the word of God in, in unleashing the power of God in our lives, it would be Matthew chapter 4, Temptation of Christ. Do you remember the story? You can turn there with me if you'd like. But there were three things that Jesus was tempted in. It was right after his baptism. He was driven out into the desert out into the wilderness to be tempted and after 40 days and 40 nights the devil came and what did he do? he quoted scripture or excuse me, he, the first time he, he said if you're the son of God command these stones to be good bread and what did Jesus do? this is, this is the, the son of God this is the one that could do whatever he wanted this is the one that could 
push Satan aside if he wanted to. He could, he could run him off. He could turn the stones into, 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 into bread. He could do whatever he wanted to have victory over Satan. And what did he do? He quoted scripture. Because the word had been hidden in his heart and he knew that the word of God was powerful and able to push aside Satan's temptation. He quoted the scripture. So the devil changes his tune. And what's he do the second time? The devil quotes scripture. You're the son of God. Throw yourself down for it is written. He'll command his angels concerning you and on their hands they'll bear you up. So Satan knows scripture too. What did Jesus say? Well, hold on. On the other hand, it's written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus used the word of God. And a third time Satan came and a third time the Lord used the word and Satan walked off. And so the word of God, even to Jesus, was powerful and alive and able to push Satan aside and give him victory. Even Jesus. The word of God is critical to our success. So spend time in prayer. Meditate and study the word. And thirdly, excuse me, fourthly, regularly engage with fellowship in fellowship with his people. I don't know if you hide, oh, excuse me, I don't know if you memorize the, the scripture much, but one of the verses that uh, I find uh, is, is very special to me is in Hebrews chapter 10. And it talks about fellowship with the body of Christ. And just so you know, the word fellowship is the Greek word koinonia, and it means to share things in common. You hear that? To, to share things in common. In fact, in the, in the first century, in 1 Corinthians, it talks about a love feast, or the koinonia, where the body of Christ would come together and they would have a meal. And they would share things in common. What that means is, it's the old-fashioned potluck, or you know, covered dish meal. And you bring food to the table, and I bring food to the table, and you open up yours, and I open up mine, and you eat some of mine, and I eat some of yours. And that's a picture of the spiritual sharing that we have, or that we need to have. You're eating my food and consuming it, and it's running through your body, and I'm consuming your food, and we've shared our food in common as a picture of, a picture of what spiritual fellowship ought to be. And so when the body comes together, and we're interacting with one another, that is critical to our growth. You cannot grow in Jesus Christ off on a mountainside by yourself. I look at Hebrews chapter 10, or listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. The writer of Hebrews says this, Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. <laughs> that means think about it, folks. Let us consider how. You need to be considering how you can stimulate the body of Christ, and I need to be considering how I can stimulate you and my family and those people that I'm discipling and whatever, whoever it might be. But I need to think about ways that I can stimulate you. I don't need to be thinking about ways you can stimulate me. I don't need to be thinking about what's in it for me. I need to be thinking about what am I bringing to the table? What am I doing to help you grow, for you to be having victory over the sin in your life? What can I do for you stimulate you to grow in your relationship with Christ. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now listen. Not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encourage one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day? Day of his return. Anybody in here not see the day of his return getting closer and closer? So that means that each one of us individually as believers need to be certain that Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 is something we take seriously. We, we do not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That means put it aside. Pretend it doesn't matter. Pretend it's optional. We, we dare not do that. If we want to be successful in putting to death the deeds of the body, if we want to tap into the ability that the Spirit of God brings to my life and to yours to have victory over sin in our lives, then we dare not stay apart from the body of Christ. Engage. Involve. Sharpen. Encourage. 
bring to the table that which you have thought through that can help others grow in a relationship with Christ. Some of those things are your spiritual gifts. Probably be critical that you know what that is. That you know what your spiritual gift is and you engage in accomplishing that for the body of Christ. God didn't give it for you. He gave yours for me. And he gave mine for you. And when we both understand that and we engage with one another accordingly, we're going to grow. Regularly engage with the body of Christ. Now we're at uh, five after. And uh, I'm going to take ten minutes and go through the rest of these verses. Uh, hopefully not too fast. But if you've jumped around with me and you find yourself in Hebrews chapter 10, please move back over to Romans chapter 8. So now we've heard about the ability to conquer the impact of the flesh on our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. But Romans 8 verse 14 goes on. For all who are being led, and this is what it says, for all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And then verse 15, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. You've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Not only do we have the ability to resist sin or have victory over sin, but we have adoption. The spirit adopts us into the family of God. At the moment of our salvation, which we described earlier, and you understand what that means. And at that moment, it's the spirit indwells us. He brings us into the family and gives us all the rights and privileges that come with that relationship. You're a child of God. All who are being led by the Spirit, passive indicative, means it's already happened. It's got results through to today. These are the sons of God. Those who are seeing victory over sin in their lives. It's not finished. It still challenges us. We're still struggling. But we're seeing victory over those sins that have entangled us forever. You see what Paul's saying here, folks, is it's not a question of biology. It's a question of obedience. We're children of the one whom we obey as a lifestyle. We obey the lusts of the flesh. We obey the inclination of Satan. We're his child. Paul has better news for the Christian. That's what he's saying in verse 15. We've not received that spirit that we used to live in. We've not received that spirit again. We don't have the spirit of slavery. Who are we? We're adopted sons. It's interesting that this verse, verse 15, is, it shows a real contrast between two spirits. One is the spirit of bondage, which is produced by the flesh. It's the spirit of the unregenerate heart. It's, it's people who, re and those, those people remain in prison. They remain incarcerated by their old nature. Slaves to their sinful desires. However, if, the whole, if we have the Holy Spirit, which we do, believer, don't ever forget. If we have the Holy Spirit within us, we no longer have the spirit of bondage. It's gone. Rather, we have the spirit of adoption. Listen, one of the greatest consequences of justification is our immediate and eternal adoption into the family of God. And as a result of that, this verse tells us, as we see in Paul's words right here, that we have the unbelievable, the, the, the unspeakable privilege of calling the God of the universe, the creator being, Father. That's what those words mean. That's, let's not be flippant enough to say, well, it means daddy. Well, technically, it, it's the most intimate word you could use to describe your father. But he's still the God of the universe. But the fact that we can kneel and say, Father, this is happening. I need you. I need your strength. I need your power. I need everything because I'm struggling. And he is the God of the universe. And he's your father. We've been adopted as his children. If we're born again today, and the spirit, the spirit then lives in our lives, and we're therefore we're his children. We're adopted into his family. But it gets better. Verse 16 goes on. 
Not only do we have the ability for victory over sin, not only do we have adoption that the Spirit brings to us, but look at verse 16. And I think we'll, we'll end with this one and I'll write an email about the fourth one. How's that sound? Look at verse 16. The Spirit himself... <laughs> this is, I got to study in this this past week and I was like, this is, this is really good stuff, so listen close. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're, we are children of God. We have assurance of the completeness and permanence of our salvation. And in my opinion, we come here to the deepest and highest level of assurance that we can attain in this life. It's kind of like a spiritual conversation that, that takes place between the spirit and our spirit that, just, that assures us that we're children of God. You know, in the final analysis, our assurance of salvation is not just a, a logical conclusion that comes after an in-depth analysis of our theology, though that's important. You know I'm committed to that, but there's more to it than that. Rather, it comes to the hearts by the testimony of God the Spirit, who bears witness with and through our spirit that we're his children. Now this truth is at the same time wondrous and dangerous. It really is. Because what Paul is not saying here is that it's through some special revelation or some mystical experience that the Spirit of God speaks to us and tells us we're his children. That's not what he's saying. We must understand that the Spirit always communicates with his people and he does throw so through his word, by his word, and never against his word. Never. He never contradicts the word of God. It's a critical that we understand that. So today, the good news is if you lack assurance of your standing before God, if you want your hearts to be at peace, go to the Word. Spend time in the Word. If you want to be led by the Spirit of God, spend time in the Spirit-inspired Word of God. And He'll lead you. Absolutely promised. The last point that I was going to make was about us being heirs. We've got an inheritance. By the way, I had to use the word and there so that I could get four A's. Just point that out. <clears throat> we have an inheritance. We have the same inheritance that Jesus Christ has. I don't know what your retirement looks like. I don't know what your inheritance might look like from your, from your parents if there was one. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You are a child of God. You are heirs with Jesus Christ and all of his kingdom is yours. Just like it's his. And when he comes in glory, you will come with him and you will be a part of that kingdom. And so when the Spirit comes into our lives... He brings these four things, based on Romans chapter 8, 12 to 17. He brings these four things to give us power and victory over sin through our prayer, through the word, through the fellowship of the body of Christ. Simple, powerful, critical that all of those things be a part of your life and mine. And until they are, number one is going to be tough for me. And if I want to have victory over sin and put to death the deeds of the body, in this life, right now, today, those steps need to be a part of my life. Spend time in the Word. Make time for prayer. Adore, confess, thank, thankfully, supplications. The old acts of prayer. We've all heard it. Just do it. Spend time in His Word and spend time with the body and you will have victory over sin in your life. That's what Paul's telling us. If you believe that today, <laughs> it's a great day. And if you're challenged by that today, simply do what God's word says we need to do and you'll find the same victory. Let's pray together. Father, Father today, make a change in our lives. We all struggle. Sin crouches outside the door and waits for us. The pressures of life, the pressures of the job, the pressures of the family, whatever it might be. 
and we have a history of maybe not being as strong as we could be. But the Apostle Paul, through the leading of the Spirit of God, has shared with us very clearly today that we have the ability through the resonant Spirit of God, third person of the Trinity lives in our lives and waits to empower and to give us victory if we will simply live in obedience to your word. And so help us to make those choices today, each one of us. And in addition, help us to encourage our brothers and sisters in those decisions. To pray for, to come alongside, and to fellowship, to share in common those things that we need to, that we might find victory over sin. We're grateful today that we are your sons and we are your daughters. We've been adopted into your family. That You've given us assurance. The Spirit of God bears testimony with our spirit that we are sons of God. And for that we give you thanks today. And in the week to come, as that assurance is challenged, we pray that you would bring it again. And we stir our hearts that we might fall more in love with you and walk with you each day. So, Father, take your word, change our lives. We're grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.